All right, I think we could probably get started. Um, this is our uh, most recent STS webinar series. This one is the real cost of patient safety. Um, our workforce on patient safety here at the Society has put this together. Um, we're really excited for you to be here. So I'm just gonna go through a few um, STS updates and then we'll hand it over to our moderator, Dr. Moffitt Bruce. Um, a few updates. Um, if you are not already, feel free to apply for STS membership. Um, you can enjoy a variety of discounts, benefits, opportunities to help you grow professionally. Um, you would be able to get um, a little bit of uh, uh, money off on the STS annual meeting. Um, so if you're not already, feel free to join um, at sts.org slash membership. And our next webinar will be on Friday, October the 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, feel free to watch the latest 8 and 8 series uh, presentation listed here. Um, you can find this um, series at the uh, QR code here on the, on the screen or also at our website. And as a reminder, the STS annual meeting is coming up um, in, it'll be our 60th annual, so that is very exciting. Um, we uh, feel free to register by October the 18th to, to secure the lowest rates um, and uh, feel free to go to our website to check that out. We will be in Texas this year uh, for a three-day three -day meeting. So we look forward to having you um, in meeting for the 60th annual meeting. So I am going to go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Moffitt Bruce, our moderator, and she'll be able to introduce our panelists here today. So thank you very much. Great, thanks very much, Emily, and welcome everybody to um, this SDS webinar series. Uh, this evening, we represent the workforce on patient safety, and our uh, seminar this evening is on what the real costs of patient safety are relative to education, public reporting, and institutional priorities. I'm Susan Moffat-Bruce, I'm the chair of the workforce, uh, and I'm a thoracic surgeon and president of Lay Hospital Medical Center. I am join, joined this evening by Joel Beyer, who is a Dalhousie University resident in cardiac surgery. Thank you for joining us, Joel. Also have Jennifer Romano, uh, who is um, at the University of Michigan, a congenital heart surgeon, and Fraser Rubens, who is um, a cardiac surgeon at the Ottawa Heart Institute. Relative to public reporting, we have an expert in this, um, John Mayer. Dr. Mayer is here um, uh, of the Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, lastly, but not least, Dr. Richard White is joining us from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where he serves as the Vice Chair of Quality uh, in the Department of Surgery. So please uh, join me in welcoming our panelists as we start um, this conversation. We wanted to cover three areas or really kind of focus on three aspects of patient safety where there may be a tension relative to um, our investment uh, relative to the outcomes. The first will be around education. And to that end, Joel, Jennifer, and Frazier are really our content experts this evening, but our other colleagues may weigh in and please feel free to use the Q&A function on the Zoom. So to enter any questions um, or to ask uh, any questions of our panelists, either virtually or uh, through the Q&A. So relative to education, the tension may be that we know that uh, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity to look at the way that we train our residents. And there's been a lot of research and literature out there that speaks to whether or not our, the way that we train or the tension that we feel relative to training the next generation of surgeon actually impacts outcomes. Um, herein, you'll see six papers that are referenced all of which come at this perspective of education versus safety in a very different way. And we hope to delve into that through our conversations with our three experts uh, this evening. Next slide. 
Relative to public reporting, we also want to see and, and talk about what is the real cost of patient safety. We know that uh, th there are a number of uh, ways that we are reported publicly, somewhat translucently or transparently uh, out there. In many instances, there are 700 top 100 hospitals, depending on who is measuring us. And this public reporting has become a bit of a cottage industry and the reality is, is that surgeons, and in many instances, cardiac, thoracic, and congenital surgeons are at the center of this reporting because of the high acuity, the high impact, and the complexity of the patients that we deal with. And then lastly, we want to talk about what is the cost of, of patient safety relative to institutional trade-offs. We know that we are moving from a volume to a value uh, proposition relative to patient safety. We know that this means that sometimes there needs to be trade-offs as to whether or not certain interventions, certain investments are actually worth their while relative to the outcomes that our patients may um, and are very deserved of. We also know that over the last several years, decades in fact, payment, reimbursement, and the way that we actually fund healthcare has changed tremendously. And volume is not sufficient uh, relative to the way that we uh, finance healthcare today. So Dr. White will be speaking to this as well. So with those three areas or those three focus, I'd like to get started. And if um, Emily, you could take down the slides, we'll start with our panelists. But well, let's get started with relative to uh, education. Um, and I'd like to start with some questions that we uh, that were compiled prior to this uh, webinar. And like I say, if you have any questions that you'd like us to ask of the panel, please enter them into the Q&A. Um, but Dr. Uh, Rubens Frazier, I'm wondering if you might just give us a sense um, relative to um, relative to education. In Canada, the Royal College and cardiac surgery training um, in as a um, as a Royal College program has moved to a competency based um, training program called CBD Competency by Design, which is based on entrustable professional activities. I'm wondering if you could give us a little sense of the history of that, and then perhaps the impact that may have on patient safety. Does it threaten it? or does it uphold patient safety? Thanks very much, Susan. So uh, I've been involved in the redesign and the reapplication of the competency by design in cardiac surgery in my role at the Royal College as the specialty chair for, the, for cardiac surgery in Canada. Um, it was a, a great honor to be involved with my colleagues to help design this process that has been put forward by the college. What we saw before was that we had um, we had a large number of trainees that were going through the time frame of cardiac surgery without the pure definition that they were competent. And, and really in a, in a specialty driven by technical skills, we often were, were finding that the, uh, the understanding of most of the surgeons and the faculty members was that we were training people to have the book knowledge of cardiac surgery. They would get their exams, but they were beholden to our, our American friends, we're providing them the opportunity to go and practice their surgery and become true surgeons when they do their extra year or two of fellowship in the States. And that was not contingent with the, the Royal College's expectations. Their expectations were that our trainees should be finished. That's what they were funding. They finish on June the 30th um, and then July 1st, they have to be able to take call and do any sort of dissection or deal with a VSD. And we, we really weren't at the point where that was an accepted philosophy. And, and we, there are many other specialties, there's 64 specialties, I believe, in the Royal, that, that the Royal College supervises, and the vast majority of them didn't have that philosophy. So um, we, did, we introduced this process, um, and we introduced a, a series of EPAs, which I believe my, our American colleagues have, have adopted in, in the same way. Um, but the key thing of, about that EPA is that it demanded that we, the surgeons and the faculty had to change their philosophy about how they were teaching so that they were true coaches and that they were also 
um, in the instant, being able to assess an individual's behavior and the individual's technical skills, as opposed to later on at the end of the rotation when you really didn't remember what they were doing at the beginning. And, uh, and it's provided a better opportunity for us to truly, uh, in, in competency committees, assess whether our, patient, our, our residents are truly competent to be able to partake in, in patient care. Has it affected patient safety? Well, what's, what does have to do, what, what happens to happen to uh, faculty members is that they ultimately have to believe what they're doing in terms of de the designation of about whether an individual is competent to do something. And they have to let them at that, from that point on, be able to do that process. So if they're competent to be able to open the chest, then, and you deem that they're competent, you, you let them do that. And, and uh, theoretically, the degree of supervision decreases as you go along. Yes, there's a risk um, because uh, you're, you're really dependent upon the quality of the, the uh, uh, assessment by the staff and the consistency of the assessment that an individual is competent to be able to do a process. But I would argue that the risk to patient safety was greater in the process where we didn't have that, where we we assumed that they were going to go off and do their fellowship somewhere and they were going to become true surgeons, even though they, they already had their fellowships and all the others. And, and that's a pretty big assumption. And there's been several cases where individuals have gone off to big fellowship training programs where they didn't get a chance to operate. And they had this prestigious name of the place that they operated in, but they actually didn't have the competent skills. And we should not, as a country, be sending our individuals out uh, outside of the country with that. So, so I'm comfortable, I'm confident that the process is working in the long term to enhance patient safety. Yes, there will be a price during residency, but the long-term benefit to patient safety in our cardiovascular community is much greater based on the produ production of good people that finish the training programs. Great, thank you very much, Frazier. Very much appreciate that answer. Uh, does um, uh, Jennifer or Joel, do you have anything to add to that uh, for that question? Yeah, I would just add, you know, the American Board of Thoracic Surgery is just starting to dip our toe into the concept of EPAs. And, and you know, to date, what quantified your technical ability at the end of training was simply a yes, no checkbox. Are you certified for independent practice, which really doesn't drill down into all the different components of care that we need to provide. And I think by adding this, it's gonna be a paradigm shift, but it allows us to really look at in focus detail, what are the different components that this individual is competent or not competent in doing? And one, being able to judge their ability to move into independent practice, but also to help trainees know this is an area where of improvement. This is an area where you have achieved what we expect. And I think it just makes it a much more clear uh, expectation with more trackable variables. So I, I think it's going to be, it's a change, a big paradigm shift, but I, I think it's going to have a great benefit. Joel, anything? Yeah, thank you. Um, and from my perspective, something I think it is really important that I've heard Dr. Rubin say prior is that, you know, the system really balances on integrity, integrity of the attendings to um, not just push through the EPAs and, and mark them quickly to get the paperwork done, but to really critically think about the performance and give feedback to the trainee. And also integrity from the trainee's uh, point of view to go through uh, the progression of skills, seeking out opportunities safely, not putting patients at harm through that process. So I think in a system where there's excellent surgical teachers and integrity with CBD and EPAs, the outcome is, as Dr. Rubin said, you know, a, a safer system for patients. Great. Thank you very much, Joel. And maybe, Jennifer, I'll come back to you. And there's a question in the Q&A that actually addresses the uh, question we had thought about uh, asking. So maybe I'll frame it in the context that our um, attendee has asked. And it basically speaks to, you know, us being very focused on outcome, being very focused on patient safety. And yet we're trying to train and balance the training with the outcomes. Um, and, and we're working within microcosms in, so, in many instances. So how can we balance the training with the outcomes? And what basically are the risks that we're willing to take? Yeah, 
honestly don't think it's changed that much along the way. I think it's more public, more transparent what we're doing and what we're faced with with training an individual. But first and foremost, our social contract is with the patient and the families and to provide them with the best outcome. So I don't think we've changed that social contract. I think you know, if I take a training through a case, I'm not thinking about like, oh, well, if this goes bad, it's going to get reported. No, I'm thinking about what is this trainee capable of doing? What are they not capable of doing? Is the entrustable uh, activities that you're able to engage them? What level are they in? And it may be that you get to a point in the case where things have shifted, have challenge has increased, and you take over that portion of the case. I think that is our responsibility as educators is to balance making sure that the patient is safe that you're taking them through a portion of the procedure that they can competently do. And if not, you take over from there. But as you know, the literature has shown that taking trainees through cases doesn't impact the patient outcomes, morbidity or mortality. If it is done with the intent of first and foremost, we are there for the patients. We are also educating our trainees. I think the EPAs and the CBDs just give it a little bit more structure that allows us to have a little bit more of a framework to have residents know what they're moving through, what the expectations are. And I think by virtue of that is create a little bit more transparency to the public of what it means to train an individual, that there are times that we need to give some autonomy and to see how a trainee can do. You know, back in my earlier days of training where there was a lot of autonomy or quite often there wasn't as much of a safety net, there wasn't public reporting. I think now I would rather take a trainee through these entrustable activities and have them in a structured setting where they have a safety net versus a checkbox saying they're competent and they're practicing those out in the public on their own. So to what Frazier said, you know, really this is a long-term commitment to really making sure that we're providing safe, safe patient care going forward as we release these individuals out into the public into independent practice. Thank you, Jennifer. Joel, I'll, I'll go over to you now as, as a trainee and, and you know, you've been in training for many years now. Just give us a perspective as to when you hear about, you know, the paradigm shift, because I believe you're still in the time-based training as compared to the competency-based training. And give us a sense of what it is from the learner's perspective to feel sometimes this tension between supervision and um, outcomes, supervision and experience. And what does that feel from, you know, like from your perspective and how might we as teachers um, and mentors help facilitate um, your, your experience? Sure. So I think you know, as a, a trainee, patient safety and good outcomes is, is always front of mind. You know, that's, there's almost a hyper-focus on that uh, when you're involved in the care of any patient. And I think what a trainee like myself can do to uphold that very high standard is that you know, when a patient's going to the operating room, know the patient, know their comorbidities, know why you're going to the operating room, and also know the technical points of the operation, how to flow through at uh, concurrent with your level of training. And when you put all those things together, along with an excellent surgical teacher, like we've discussed so far, you know, I think that is the, the best equation um, to have a good outcome and uphold the patient safety. And as Dr. Romano pointed out, this has been studied in the United States and in the UK, a number of observational studies, a propensity match studies and systematic review and meta-analyses. And when they compared resident-led cases uh, to consultant-led cases and low-risk adult or congenital cardiac surgery, uh, morbidity mortality was, was basically the same. Trainees had slightly longer bypass times and cross-clamp times on average, which is expected. Um, of course, there's various confounding and biases with these retrospective studies, but I really believe that the mentorship model um, that we've gone through for um, many years now uh, is upheld and uh, can have good outcomes and uphold patient safety. Thank you very much. And so it really talks about having a responsibility for the learner as well as, as that, that person that's, that's doing the training. Jennifer um, or Frazier, any thoughts about some of the tensions or relative to public reporting or patient safety and say a faculty member or a surgeon that's learning a new technique or is later in their career and now has changed um, their, their practice? Any thoughts about the tension or how that might be managed um, relative to outcomes versus training uh, a, a new, uh, in a new technique? 
Uh, you, you know, uh, the, the fluidity of change in our specialty is, um, is dramatic. And, and as you, all of us have shared, what we do now is not at all what we were doing when we first started our, our uh, training. I guess my advice to, to trainees is that they, they need to embrace those changes. And if I don't show them that I can embrace it and then share new techniques with them at the same time, they're not going to, they're not going to innovate themselves and go forward. I must admit it's it's harder when you're doing something new. You you want to you feel some lack of confidence yourself, and so that's a hard thing to pass that over to the resident. Uh, and there's I think the the best way to do it is you have to have support from your divisions that if you're going to make a modification, you'll have the appropriate volume so that you if you're a good teacher, you have the the capacity to learn quickly yourself and then pass it on to others. Uh, there's got to be some flexibility to benefit the teachers and give them some incentive to pass that on um, it, because uh, it, there's nothing better than, than being able to give new techniques to, to residents and help uh, explore those things together. That's my feeling on how you deal with it. Yeah. Thank and, you, Jennifer. Yeah, and I think, again, it's it's that, that relationship between the learner and the educator, understanding if we're doing a brand new procedure, there's going to be a learning curve for the attending. And I think to some degree, it's helpful for them to watch somebody who they think is confident in doing anything and everything experience a learning curve and how they work through it and understand that there's going to be a pause before that's something that you can bring a learner through. Um, but again, I think it's having the commitment of the institution that these are things that are important and that you're taking on something that is, you are taking on something new, it's well thought out plans have been, been developed, you've made sure you have the appropriate team and structure to support it. Because I think there is always the concern that with public reporting, there will be risk aversion, uh, desires not to take on the more challenging cases, perhaps not to innovate, which really is not in the best interest of our patients in the long term. But I think if it's an appropriately structured environment where you make sure that you have the, the support that is necessary and it's a well thought out plan, that's, that's our job is to continue to try to make things better every day. And I think showing the trainees what it's like, they're going to experience this, this through their career, moments of growth. You know, your other question was about, you know, the, the aging surgeon, the surgeon that's going through changes in career, perhaps is doing more administrative, less time in the operating room. I think, again, there's also challenges there of how do we assess competency? And I think this is an area of increasing focus as we look at the surgeon population that is aging. Um, you know, I think it's important that we make sure that we are maintaining our appropriate skill set. You know, quite often you're balancing changes in physical competency for years of expertise and experience and um, decision-making ability. And how do you put those two things together? Okay. Thank you very, very much. Richard or uh, John, anything to add from a a relative to the educational trade-off for patient safety before we move into public reporting? Well, Susan, the only thing I'd like to add is initially when the various entrustable activities came out and you had a list and you give them a score and things like that, I will admit I wasn't a great fan of that. Um, I, I found that I'm not, I find that they're quite good for structuring my thought. And in I, I've never been a great fan of people telling me how to structure my own thoughts. But I, I would agree with uh, uh, Dr. Romano that um, how we train residents, I don't think has changed very much over the years, to be perfectly honest. I think that these things do help us figure out what we're doing well, what we're not doing well, where the residents doing, what the residents are doing well and what they're not doing well and how we can coach them. But for this to be effective, you have to have some flexibility. It's not enough to just give them a score. You've got to be able to come up with some system to boost what they're not doing particularly well. And I think that some residencies are very good at that and other residencies are probably less good at that. So I've gradually sort of become more of a fan of this, but I do worry that it's sort of a, what I would say, a, a subjectively or objectively subjective grade, right? You've got these various criteria and how you score someone is based on these objective criteria, but you, there is some, some, some subjectivity in it. And then there is the issue of, while you may be able to do individual components, can you put it all together and do a safe operation 
from top to bottom, which is what that person needs to be able to do when they're done. And you've got the issue of, well, they may be able to do something very competently in a straightforward case. What if it's not that straightforward? And you don't always know if it's gonna be a straightforward case before you go into it. You may think it's gonna be fine. I think we've all been in these situations where we go into an operation, oh, this is gonna be a slam dunk, it's not gonna be difficult. And bang, you get into you get into trouble, you find it's harder than you thought. Um, that said, I would agree with Jen that this is better than the old system where you just said, yeah, they're good to practice on their own. Um, but I, I think that we could, it, there's still opportunities for doing this better, quite frankly. Okay. Thank you, Richard. I'm gonna turn it over to John now to comment and then lead us into uh, public reporting. Well, I, I think the important considerations that have already been mentioned about being under the microscope, I would argue that that's particularly an issue in the congenital heart world, maybe even more so than in other uh, sub-disciplines. Uh, but I, I do think we should all keep in mind those of us who are in academic institutions where part of our responsibility is to train the next generation as has been described. But I, <clears throat> I would uh, also remind us all that, you know, as members of a profession, you know, we have uh, among our mandates, uh, this maintaining, advancing, and disseminating a body of knowledge. Uh, and I think uh, emphasis in this context on the disseminate a body of knowledge, that's what we have to do. Uh, I will have to say personally from my own experience, having been at this for a long time, uh, as uh, what I uh, somewhat tongue in cheek called the, the no hair, gray hair perspective, uh, you know, it is a hard thing to do to help somebody do uh, a case, much easier always to just do it yourself. And yet we have to, I think, uh, uh, so we can train the next generation. We clearly, you know, have to swallow that and think about it in terms of not only the complexity of the operation, but the capabilities of the trainee. Uh, and make those judgments, as I think Dr. Romano uh, described, but I would only reemphasize uh, that that's not always the easiest thing to do uh, when you're the person standing on the opposite side of the table from where you might be more accustomed to standing uh, and serve as an assistant rather than as, a, uh, as the operating surgeon. I, one other aspect, that might be worth uh, something is uh, just having worked in a teaching institution for so long, uh, I would tell you that one of the most common questions that comes from parents who are sending their child off to the operating room is that I got was, are you going to be doing this operation? Uh, because the public now is pretty sensitized to this notion that, um, you know, that if it's a teaching institution, you know, is it going to be the resident or is it going to be the fellow or is it going to be the intern, God forbid, you know, that sort of thing. And, and the way I responded to that, and I'd be interested to other people's comments, is uh, I always told them that these were complicated operations, that there were some things that were more easily done from one side of the table than the other, and that I would be there and responsible. But uh, I, uh, I think that that satisfied almost all families uh, that I had to deal with. Uh, and I think it's important to, you know, that we have a prepared response, if you will, because we're increasingly going to be getting that question. So, so John, to that end, and relative to, you know, having been um, in this field for a long time and seen lots of changes, and maybe none as, as impactful as what we've seen the last 10 years relative to data collection, transparency, public reporting. 
what are the behaviors that we're starting to see or that we have to be aware of so that we can mitigate and put strategies in place so to eliminate kind of the shame and blame um, the risk aversion um, what are you seeing and what advice would you give to learners trainers mentors faculty i think we have to first of all be aware that this is the environment we are working in uh, and this or what the public many of the public we shouldn't make it all the public, but many members of the public are thinking about or have read about in the newspaper or whatever. Uh, so I, I think it's a matter of being prepared for that, both psychologically on the part of the surgeon, uh, because you have to be uh, confident in yourself as well as in your trainee that you can make the outcome as good as it would have been had you been doing the operation yourself and to have that judgment about when to, as Dr. Romano uh, described, uh, when to take over the, the case. Uh, so I think, you know, having thought about those things ahead of time is important. I think another important concern uh, and downside or dark side, perhaps, of public reporting is the effect that it might have on the willingness to undertake something that's high risk. So a risk of averse, aversion, if you will. Uh, there are, um, you know, there are clearly our potential impacts. Uh, you know, we might do something that's safer and might have a better short-term outcome, uh, but actually may be worse over the long term for that patient. Uh, so, you know, I think back to the early days of arterial switch operations where the existing atrial level repair had a quite acceptable 5% uh, mortality rate. Uh, and when we were talking about and starting to do arterial switch operations, you were looking at a significantly higher mortality, uh, at least initially. And yet what we were banking on, and which has in fact turned out to be true, was that it's better to have your operation result in a left ventricle as your systemic ventricle. Uh, and we actually got to equipoise based on some multi-institutional studies that actually followed the patients out for a year or two after the operation and compared treatment pathways as opposed to treatment operations. Um, I don't want to belabor that, but because uh, it would take a minute to explain it. But I do think that the real issue here that we have to be aware of and we have to be able to explain to patients and families, you know, is when we're going into a different direction than what was traditionally uh, the course, that, that we just have to be able to explain the rationale. And I think most patients sort of get it. And, and I would add that most everything that I ever tried to explain to anyone who wasn't a physician was about medicine being an odds business. And we were always trying to pick the course of treatment that gave patients the best odds and the least risk. And no treatment we were gonna provide either in the operating room or I would argue anywhere in medicine is free of risk. We're always trying to do the less risky. The important consideration here, though, is, are two, the impact on patient selection and, you know, operative approach selection uh, influenced by risk aversion because of the fear of what it's going to look like uh, in public reporting. And, and the other, I think, corollary to that is the potential negative impact on the willingness to undertake something innovative uh, you know, it's easy when you've got a high risk lesion and, you know, there's 
no expectation that you're going to have a perfect result. But when the lesions become more quote unquote routine, you know, then the patients become more risk averse in that. And I think that easily can influence us as the surgeons who are the caregivers uh, that we become more risk averse. And I think those are things to both recognize and then have to have strategies for dealing with uh, because we do have those responsibilities to maintain and advance, you know, this field of knowledge that we're uh, involved in. Mm -hmm. And so do you think though, John, that, you know, many of us work in academic medical centers and we're surrounded with lots of resources and we can always phone a friend, but in those areas that are less resource, but still are subject to public reporting, are we seeing, um, you know, behaviors, risk adverse behaviors that are impacting our scores, our patient safety uh, public reporting, and how do we manage that? Um, as we go forward, because this is this is going to continue to grow as we go forward. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I would uh, argue that uh, another one of our responsibilities and as members of a profession is to self-regulate. And I think that that goes from the individual surgeon level, like should I really take this case on in my institution with its capabilities or should I send it, you know, elsewhere right. uh, where there are more resources or maybe there's a person down the street who's got more expertise uh, and, you know, you would rather send the patient to, to that institution or individual surgeon or whatever. I, I do think that uh, back to the public reporting aspect of this, uh, you know, there are some, there are real challenges in trying to um, make sure that we properly risk adjust uh, in right. any of our public reporting. Uh, and I think that that is a challenge. It's I'm, most familiar, of course, with the congenital heart world. And, you know, we have worked very hard with the congenital heart surgery database to figure out the best way to publicly report, making sure that we're both fair to the patients and fair to the institutions and surgeons. Um, and a lot of it has to do with risk adjustment methodology, but also, uh, you know, particularly in our world, uh, you know, where we have a couple of hundred operations and we have, mm. you know, remarkable variety of ways that the heart cannot develop normally. Um, you know, it is a real challenge. And, and I do think that, um, you know, that's our responsibility as the STS in yeah. the profession is to try to keep improving the risk adjustment uh, and to be careful about what we publicly report, uh, because, uh, you know, there are a lot of statistical uh, nuances to this, but uh, I do think that uh, you can unfairly or incorrectly, perhaps better word, uh, you know, portray an institution or a uh, individual surgeon uh, in an unfair way by not properly risk adjusting. And, and I think that's, that's a real significant issue. Uh, yeah, I that, think so. I think that, so, John, we, I think we have we to, have, we have to own that though, though, don't we, as a society, I mean, that's being at the table, that's influencing, that's understanding um, what we're, what data we're submitting and how is it adjusted relative to our patient population demographics. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. This is not, we need to be part of the solution, right? In this instance, um, as, and that's where, you know, being part of the society is so important, especially with our data uh, base being so robust. Right. Perfect. Well, thank you for that. And I think what I'm gonna do is just, start to pivot over to Richard, because what we're talking about here, ultimately what relative to, or whether or not we're talking about education, mentoring, public reporting, this all takes investment. And as we know, there are finite resources, regardless of what, uh, if you're north of the border or south of the border, the resources are finite. And so decisions have to be made. 
Um, so just give us a sense, Richard, and maybe from your own, you know, stance where you where you sit right now, kind of, you know, in administration and as well as uh, as a surgeon, you know, what are some of the important trade offs, and what are some of the important investments that have to be made to ensure good outcomes? Yeah. So. Susan, I'm, I'm not muted. Good. So, Susan, I think that those are great questions. And first, I would say the topic of the webinar is the real cost of patient safety, right? So you have to be able to define what is safety and essentially is safety the same as quality? So I think of safety as being either the absence of errors um, or the absence of preventable harm. Now, preventable obviously is a somewhat subjective term. Errors, uh, what's uh, the wrong thing to do in one person's eye is not always the wrong thing to do in somebody else's eye. You can have errors that don't lead to harm, and you can have harm that doesn't come from errors. So it's a bit of a difficult thing to quantitate, um, unless you you are very careful in how you what you call a safety issue. Now, I would say what a lot of us do, and and I oversee quality and safety for a a a. a multi-divisional department, not just cardiac or thoracic, but everything from podiatry and ophthalmology to neurosurgery, including acute care surgery and this, that, and the other. And, you know, I, I think that safety is a subset of quality. Um, what we used to call the Institute of Medicine broke down, broke down quality into several domains, one of which is safety, others of which include equity, efficiency, uh, efficacy, so on and so forth. So it's hard to just look at safety per se. I will tell you that many hospitals have these electronic safety reports. I, I don't think they look at safety at all. They look at complaints, um, often personnel, personality or personnel type or uh, uh, interpersonal communication things, which ultimately could become safety issues, but by and large aren't safety per se. Um, I think that there's a lot of safety or issues or errors that don't filter up through these quote, you know, safety reporting systems, which we all used to call incident reports. Um, you know, so it's hard to look at that. You can look at quality, which is a much larger area. Um, and we have different ways to do that. I mean, the STS database is one way. There's STS cardiac, congenital and, and thoracic components. You know, when you've got a larger department, you have to also look at general surgery and other areas. And we can use NISQIP, the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program by the college to look at that. Um, if you're sitting in <clears throat> a higher level, Susan, your level as a hospital president, you've got to look at quality and safety across the whole organization. Um, so surgery, medicine, perhaps GYN, uh, you know, anesthesia and, and various departments. And no single database really does this marvelously, I don't think. I mean, in our institution, we use the Visient database. Uh, you, you know, it, it's gone through different names over the years, but it's an administrative data set. It uses ICD-10 codes from discharges to look at that. So not quite the granularity that the STS database or NISQIP has. Uh, but it's used to look at quality issues across the, enti the entire inpatient uh, portfolio of the hospital um, and is being extended to look at outpatient as well. But we're using it primarily, I mean, exclusively at this point for inpatient. And one of the areas that Visient looks at is safety. Um, but it, because it uses administrative data sets, personally, I don't feel it's quite as accurate um, as some of the, it's clinically validated as you and I have discussed, but um, it, it's not quite the same as looking at individual uh, patients' charts with clinically defined and relevant definitions. Um, nonetheless, you, you can use that database, and we do, to look at safety and the other domains of quality. Um, you know, but it, 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 this is where, where we are. You have to sort of choose where are you gonna look for safety issues and how granular do you want to get? I think like STS database or, or NISQIP gives you very good um, clinical look at, at quality, but it's hard to tease out safety events uh, unless you look at individual cases. Um, so this is a tough thing to look at, but the question was, what you know, what's the true cost? Well, you know, you can look at this financially. What do you invest in NISQIP? What do you invest in STS? How much money do you spend on Vizient? 
How many nurse abstractors do you need? You know, do you get into this whole uh, documentation game where everybody's, you know, trying to maximize their, their coding, which everybody plays, quite frankly. And if you don't, you're going to lose. Um, and, and so it depends how well you play the game. Quite frankly, that's my, my feeling about this. But if you don't play that game, you're definitely going to lose that game. Um, so you have to look at what's the cost. But I think mo more importantly, if you don't have good safety, what's the cost of that? Now, there's a financial cost through your malpractice carrier. There's a reputational cost. There's the fact that if you do badly in one area, does that, does that reputation spill over to all of your other areas? If you're part of a hospital network, um, which your institution, Susan, and mine is part of the same hospital network, if we're doing badly, does that, re does that, is there are repercussions there across the Boston metropolitan area that we all then look bad because we've had safety issues. So to sort of pin down what's the cost of the true cost of safety is a very challenging thing to look at. I think it's probably easier to look at the two true cost of quality and you can look at the financial cost. Um, it's hard to know the reputational costs in, unless you do poorly, quite frankly. And you can look at that sort of retrospectively. What happens to things like your market share, your case volume, things like that. Um, but and, and when you look, when you drill down some of those quality issues, even things that can affect your Medicare reimbursement, mm -hmm. uh, readmission rate, length of stay, hospital acquired conditions, UTI, central line infections, things like that, that can cost you absolute dollars. Um, but reputational cost is, as, as we hear, somewhat priceless. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's interesting, Richard, because I think that, you know, when we have to look at patient safety, regardless of whether you're a thoracic surgeon, cardiac surgeon, um, congenital surgeon, gen any sort of uh, surgeon or, or physician, there is an investment, right? There's, there's an investment of time, there's an investment of learning, and then there's an institutional investment. And I just want to maybe nail down a little bit, you know, you've mentioned the Visient, you've mentioned STS, you've mentioned NISQIP, all of which have quality and patient safety inherent to it. Does there come a time whenever you feel there's a tension between administration and surgeons to give the not appropriate, but maybe the needed resources that are required to save your reputation, to improve your patient safety? And what kind of role does a surgeon have relative to advocating for those, um, what we feel to be necessary resources. Yeah. So, Susan, that that's that's another great question. And I mean, to be honest, you as the the CEO or the president of Leahy Clinic are the ones that decide where the money for Leahy Clinic is going, not me. My role is to advocate for this through the various administrative channels and the committees that I sit on, and and I try to use objective data to make a good case for where for where you should invest your money. Um, you know, there, there's money that's invested in data acquisition, right? All of these things, STS, Visient, NISQIP, blah, blah, blah. They cost money. Um, and you can be very data rich, but essentially effector arm poor. Because to make to make effective changes, you're working in a in a in a hospital system, right? I don't mean like a system with Lee Clinic and BI Deaconess and this, that, and the other. I mean within your hospital, you've got a lot of it different constituencies. You know, you you've got the surgeons, you've got the nurses, you've got I mean uh, everything that you have to sort of put together to make things change. And I think that many of our hospitals are a little like aircraft carriers. They're very hard to get them to change direction, uh, but to impact patient safety and quality, sometimes you have to make these. Um, I think that I don't envy your job. You've got a fixed amount of money, you know? You've got a certain amount of money and you got to figure out where you're going to spend it. There are certain things you kind of have to do. You kind of have to do Visient these days because if you're an academic te teaching institution, you get ranked. You're X out of Y you know, one is good, 150 is not so good. Um, and that's what people are going to look at. Um, you know, and as you pointed out in your earlier slide, there's tons of various uh, w ways to look at this. Is it US News World Report? Is it Visient? Is it NISQIP? Is it STS? If you're a three-star institution or a two-star institution, Medicare star ratings, you name it, there's a million of them. And you kind of have to figure 
what is the most important, where you want to focus your energies and where you're going to focus your efforts. As I said before, there's very definite um, financial implications for not doing well with things like C. diff or readmission. That's right. Medicare says, we'll take away 2% and maybe we'll give it back to you, but maybe not. And, um, you know, that that's real dollars. And if you don't get that, this is sort of money that you're essentially tearing up and throwing down the drain. And it's stuff that you can't reinvest. Um, that's right. So that's right. These are the issues. And all we can do as practicing surgeons is sort of advocate for our docs, advocate for our colleagues, advocate for our patients. Patients. Because I think we all want things to go well. We don't want safety issues. It's bad on so many levels. It, it is bad on every have level. Experienced staff, experienced PAs, experienced nurses. You've got to have a good. You can't have too many people coming and going. There's a million ways that you can you have to deal with this, and they all cost money, unfortunately. Do they do? So I'm just going to turn over to Fraser for a moment, and Joel just says, um, you know, the first of all, Fraser, you're in another country, in another system. Kind of the the cost of patient safety that you perceive the, the tension that uh, we haven't brought up yet that you want to share uh, relative to the Canadian context? Well, we, we don't necessarily have the same issues with regards to risk aversion in some centers. Uh, you know, I'm blessed to be living, working in a center that is, you know, we're, we're it, there's nowhere else to go. So we don't have any competition. And so we have to do everything and you have individual variants in terms of the, the outcomes. Uh, but you're really looking more at institutional um, outcomes uh, based on SDS outcomes. But there's no, we don't have the the weighting uh, uh, problems that that have been described in our American counterparts, where there's a holdback from the CMS of, of money for for uh, uh, remuneration for problems. Probably getting there, but not yet. Yeah, uh, we, we do have uh, provincial um, differences or pro provincial outcomes that are reported by the Canadian Institute for uh, Health Research, uh, which are really telling. Uh, overall, uh, the outcomes are, are very consistent across all the provinces, but that we have outliers. And then things happen within the province to, to make changes uh, positive. Um, um, the the um, so I think I think the system works. I, I feel for my American colleagues who have far more uh, open presentation of their own data. Uh, it, it's a, of their institutional data and and uh, and then their their own data within the the context of their referring physicians. Uh, I'm not sure it's entirely the, the right way to go. It doesn't currently impact on educational strategies um, because the, it, in general it washes out uh, the good teachers. Who are patient who can lead the residents through in general don't have worse results and there it doesn't really impact individual outcomes or referral patterns. Joel, thank you. Thank you. What yeah, you I was just gonna in terms of Halifax yeah. and how they're working. Yep, yep. turn it over sure. to Joel. Joel, just for context, when I finished my fellowship with Richard in 2004, there were no quality indicators being reported at that time to CMS. Now that's not, I know it's a long time ago by, by all people's um, comparison, but that's, you know, that's a decade or, or so. And, and, you know, it all of a sudden it's, ex it's exponential. So from your perspective, as a learner in a different system, but you've now, you've been in the U.S. as well, what, how, how are residents thinking, how are learning, learners thinking about these tensions between public reporting resources and, um, you know, your ongoing learning um, as lifelong learners? Yeah, I think, you know, something that nearly all CT residents and fellows want is to operate and learn the trade, you know, become competent clinicians, competent surgeons, and have good outcomes. Uh, as Dr. Rubens was uh, pointing out, uh, you know, within Canada, uh, it's regionalized. So there's one center for a large catchment area, and only very rarely are patients transferred out of those areas. Um, locally, uh, we benefit from a division of really excellent teachers who are patient, who do know how to step in when help is needed for trainees and, and prevent any uh, adverse outcomes. And also, um, we don't have uh, the time pressures that I think some other institutions have. So for example, the, I don't believe there's any penalty um, if the operation goes past six o'clock, which in other jurisdictions, that surgeon might be penalized at the expense of a trainee uh, going through new aspects. Um, I did have one question uh, for Dr. White, because um, something he said resonated really well with me. And it's something we've talked about on our workforce. 
Uh, administrative data is very good at pointing towards a problem, but it doesn't solve the root causes of that problem. So that's why we like to marry it uh, with things like our rapid fire or quips analysis that we've presented here before, because then you, you know what the problem is and why the problem is happening. Therefore, you can design a good quality improvement initiative to hopefully address that specific problem. So my question for Dr. White is that, because uh, Visient and ST seem that data capture mechanism, are they developing or do they have the effector arm mechanisms? Because, you know, that second half is very important for improving quality of care and also patient safety. Yeah, so so that's a, a great question. And, and, and I don't know the answer to all of that. I would say that some of the things such as the administrative data sets are 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 good. They're good for pointing out where there's smoke. Um, and often when there's smoke, there's fire. They're they're not perfect data sets, but they do give you an idea where to drill down. And you can look at that to figure out what's going on. I would say that um, you know, one of the things that NISQIP is doing now, and, and other uh, areas have done this in cardiac surgery, the Northern New England Collab Collaborative, the Virginia Cardiac Collaborative, and places like that. Michigan's done it, um, where you use clinical data, typically through STS or through NISQIP, and you get together with other institutions and you try mm -hmm. to share your outcomes and essentially your tricks of the trade. And as they say, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. So if, if you, you try to figure out what's going wrong or who's doing a good job and who's doing a bad job, if you're doing a bad job, you're typically not terribly keen on showing how bad you are. But if you're doing a good job, you're typically more, more than willing to share how good you are and how you how you get to that point. So we have a, a Massachusetts NISQIP collaborative. Um, you know, I, I, I used to be in, in Michigan and, and Jen Romano's left already, but I used to, when I did my training and first faculty job was in Michigan and we had a Michigan cardiothoracic collaborative. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I went to a meeting of that um, a few years ago and there's a great deal of sharing of information. And that's kind of the effector arm. I think that the organizations, I mean, STS puts on how to improve your outcomes and things like that. We used to have a group that could go around to institutions that are sort of at flying at treetop level to try them figure out how they're doing. Not a terribly effective way of doing it, quite frankly. Uh, but the sharing of ideas, I think, is a very good way to do it. Um, you know, then you get to how do these things get financed in Michigan? My recollection is the the uh, uh, Blue Cross. Uh, the insurance the, companies, yeah, yeah, the yeah. insurance companies fund it. Um, you know, in in Massachusetts for the NISQIP collaborative, we don't. I mean, we just having each institution throw in a few thousand dollars, so it doesn't have this millions of dollars that the Michigan uh, Surgical Collaborative has. There, there's a collaborative up in the Pacific Northwest. I think that John Meyer was probably pre president of the STS around the time that the Virginia Cardiac Collaborative was involved and decreased their blood transfusion rates significantly. There's a whole list of things, but this is the, the, the large thing, the large organizations, the large databases are just that, they're databases. They're, I, getting to the root of the problem and fixing them is a much more granular process and requires a lot of individual collabor collaboration, whether it's across with your colleagues or whether it's working deep, carefully or, or in depth with your institution to make sure that there's everybody's on board because quite frankly, everybody, nobody likes to change. Um, nope. I don't like things differently. And you have to sort of somehow either get every people on board with your recommendations for change or you have to be somewhat coercive. Um, and even if there's coercion, there tends to be pushback. And, and um, I think anybody that's been in an administrative role will sort of see that just because you say to do something doesn't mean it happens. No, if that's uh, that's that's very, uh, very, very appropriate, uh, Richard. I'm just gonna turn it over to John for the last word and then thank my colleagues for joining me. John? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's several thoughts that I think are worth exploring and we don't have time to do that, but I do remember one lesson that uh, I learned from the people who are working in the Northern New England Cardiovascular Study Group, and that I think it's sort of a key uh, concept, and it is using variations in outcomes as a tool for improvement and not as a means for profiling. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot wrapped up in that, 
And I would say that, you know, the one of the tensions that I think we are feeling, and uh, like most things in bioethics, there are always more than one side to a story. But I think the two things we're trying to balance are, number one, how to fulfill the societal interest in knowing things, knowing outcomes, you know, public reporting, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, recognizing that a lot of the information sharing and everything uh, that we want to try to accomplish is best accomplished, you know, in a closed room where people can speak freely without risk of repercussions. You know, there's the analogy to the to the uh, commercial airline uh, industry where you know the reporting system is actually anonymous. Uh, and so there's no nothing adverse that happens to somebody who reports a problem. And it's actually under a different arm of the uh, of the government, uh, you know, than the Federal Aviation Administration. It's actually a NASA run uh, enterprise. I, I think that understanding that there is that tension between the public, quote unquote, need to know and what we can do to fulfill our professional responsibilities about disseminating knowledge and helping advance the field, uh, I think is a, you know, is sort of one of those fundamental tensions that I'm not sure anybody's got exactly the answer to, but I think it's important to recognize that that's one of the fundamental issues that we have to deal with. Thank you for that, John. And thank you for wrapping us up in a good way and, and kind of putting uh, it all in context. So thank you to all of my panelists. Um, I am very grateful um, and grateful to the, uh, the, ta the workforce on patient safety for uh, hosting this webinar tonight and to the STS. So thank you all for those that attended and we will uh, also have this recorded uh, as well as transcribed. So thank you very much and over to you, Emily, to close us out. All right, everyone. I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists as well. And um, this will be on the SES YouTube channel um, shortly. So feel free to uh, share with your colleagues. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you Joel, for Be well. Thank you. Be well.